All right. Hello. Welcome to the ASP.NET Community Standup. I'm John Galloway. I'm a PM on the .NET Community team. And today we're joined by Saurabh Shrihadi. And so you work on a lot of cool stuff. Um, but I, th I think some of the, the stuff we've talked to you recently about is is very like it's server oriented. And can you describe your... <laughs> yeah. So one of the things that I work on now is diagnostics and observability of the .NET platform all up. So irregardless of the application model you use, you're probably interested in figuring out what's happening, what's going wrong. You know, maybe you're curious in like performance insights, why something is taking so long. So generally, you know, that encompasses uh, diagnostics and observability. And, you know, we've been in the .NET space, we've been working all the way from, you know, like logs and metrics that everyone uses to deep diagnostics and dump analysis. So there's a lot of good stuff happening in that area. But today I kind of wanted to, you know, hop on the show, obviously hang out with you, John, and talk about distributed tracing. Awesome. And just, you know, I think suspense is good. And you were talking to me before the call, you've got a very cool webcam going that you said's blue screened your computer a few times recently. So yeah. just, yeah, so this is, that could be like, you know, just if, you know, if, if anyone loves suspenseful TV shows, this could be that. So, so. fingers crossed. Let's see what happens. <laughs> we'll see how it goes. Okay. I will jump right into the community links. I got some fun, interesting ones today. Um, as always, I share these at the end. Actually, I'll, I'll throw them in the, um, and so you can follow along community links. And we'll see if I can type. There we go. So I, I threw those out in the chat. All right. So here we go. First of all, one really exciting one. James uh, just posted about this last week. So this is the .NET Live TV. And what's really cool with this is we started with the ASP.NET community stand-up, like back when .NET Core was still being kind of designed. And since then, over time, James and I worked together and we started the Thursday shows up. And those include like desktop tooling, um, you know, all kinds of like mobile, all the different kind of areas. And then since then, we've had it on Wednesday shows. And so we have EF and machine learning. And so especially this year with everyone, you know, working from home and, and um, you know, we felt like these shows are really important. So we built out and, and James ran this. It's amazing. So this is this whole .NET Live TV. So it includes not just the community standups, but it also includes things like Jeff Fritz doing the C Sharp um, there's this C Sharp corner with InstaFluff. There's the .NET Docs show. So this is kind of your one place for watching all the shows. Um, so this is neat. One one thing I want to call out here that's really cool. We've got the Blazor Focus show starting up soon. So Safia Abdullah is going to be running that. And um, so this is basically this is where you can find all the stuff. Um, so really excited about this. And this site is built using Blazor, which is really neat. So. I've uh, I've been able to like watch as James and the Blazor teams doing code reviews and helping um, get it all set up and everything. So it's 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 really um, it's an it's a cool site and I'm really excited about it. I hear you had an interesting outage on the new site last week. Do you have uh, a story about that? No, actually, well, I mean, it's been up and down. I forget. oh yeah, well, that was certs, right? There was a key uh, yeah. cert rotation issue. Yeah. <laughs> so there's there's that. There's been all kinds of interesting things I've been learning as far as how they do um, loading and, you know, um, some of the things were originally like this. Some of the site was originally the code that we wrote was Razor Pages and then they did Blazor Server and now it's Blazor WebAssembly. And um, so it's really pretty cutting edge stuff um, how they're doing it. So, yeah. Okay, this is an interesting one I saw come across. This is from Alex, and he's writing about, uh, he's asking some in interesting questions. So he's saying, why are web apps, here he wants to, you know, look at, you know, buying something on Amazon, and it's, it's you know, it's a huge, it takes like several seconds to load, and there's a ton of data being, being sent over the wire and stuff. And then he compares that to, um, you know, something like Doom. And, you know, he says, like, what's the frames per second that we get in, the, you know, when you're, when you're just, like, running a Doom app? <laughs> or, you know what I mean? Running a game. Why, why 
are these web applications so slow? So he actually does uh, somewhere towards the beginning, I'm, I'm missing it here, but he, he does talk about the like, why are they not that quick? And he's got an interesting system that he's written up here. And this does, it's dependency tracking um, for everything in the page. And he actually, it's, it's um, uses Blazor on the front end and he's, he's using web, web sockets and he's actually got this library called Fusion. And so it's do, doing this, um, actually it's not just tied to Blazor. He's got a, a sample using Blazor, but he's got a lot of different ones. But the idea here is where he's doing change tracking and allowing for very rapid updates um, based on uh, tracking just the things that need to be updated. So instead of like, if you look at something like one of these page loads, you're reloading tons of stuff and you're sending tons of information over the wire. And what he's building is examples that are just doing very um, tight change tracking. Um, so it's very interesting. He's got a lot of interesting um, samples that you can dig into in his repos. So I'd, I'd love to hear comments on this, how people are, um, you know, how, uh, if if people could look into this and see see what they think, I think there's some very interesting ideas there. All right, here's an interesting one from uh, Madhu, and he's looking at can I write a Blazor component with no no uh, HTML and no events, and so basically just write a class, and it's kind of a just did you know you could do this sort of thing. Um, so here he's creating a class inheriting from my component. And then he's got some handlers. Um, so for instance, he's got a render delegate and he's got set parameters async and he's got this I component attach. And using that, this is a symbol self-contained class that renders in this case, this, um, this component. So, you know, he's, a, a lot of it is just interesting to see how it's, how it's wired up and how the kind of Blazor internals work. I do think this could be interesting for distributing uh, classes and stuff. It's just a very, you know, tight, single uh, C-sharp file. So neat stuff. All right, Brian Laguna is writing about using NPM packages in Blazor. So there's a lot of great libraries out there, JavaScript libraries that are available in NPM. And, uh, you know, especially at this point in where we're at with Blazor, uh, Blazor itself being relatively new, and there aren't a huge, there's not always a one-to-one -one mapping of everything you want that's available as a Blazor component. There's more stuff out there in NPM. So he's showing how to set that up. So he does a walkthrough. He shows, you know, using setting up NPM directly in your app, uh, doing uh, installing, and then uh, like with Webpack CLI as a developer dependency, setting up the build script for it and uh, then integrating it into your Blazor application. And then here he shows, you know, NPM build run, and you can set up your CS proj to actually run those NPM tasks. So there's definitely different ways to do this. I've seen also people just taking JavaScript and wrapping that using the Blazor, um, you know, using Blazor interop and creating a light wrapper component. But this is interesting to see the full kind of walkthrough using NPM. All right, Andrew Locke, uh, again with an amazing series. So we've been showing a few of these. Here he's showing on running with Kubernetes. Um, and here he's looking specifically at running database migration. So he's actually got two here. He's got uh, one on running when deploying. And then this specific run one is on using jobs and init containers. And so here he talks through uh, how he's how he's running this, and th this is always you know database migrations are are tricky, and there's different ways to do it. Um, a lot of the time, I've heard from different teams, some are or it's it's only you know that's something that the DBAs run, and you know we don't do anything with that, or because it, it can be a little tricky how you handle it. Um, but so here's the example using using that setting that up using the init containers. He talks through. Uh, some of the different options, you know, you can use EF core migrations from global tool. You can execute them manually calling database migrate. Um, you can use some great libraries out there or uh, using some sort of different tool. So here he's got a console application as a, um, and he's showing using a migrator doing that. So, um, so, you know, a nice kind of walkthrough 
setting that up. Um, curious in the in the chat as well if you've got a, a system that you use for doing migrations. So, uh, and then of course uh, he ends. I love how his posts end up. He he always you know gives his his link to a source and then he talks about um, you know he sums it up and talks about how he's he's got that set up and um, using a Helm chart installation. This is just something that applies for everybody. This is really cool. This is uh, code navigation for C Sharp uh, repositories in GitHub. So this was just announced yesterday. So now as you are browsing your C Sharp repositories, you actually get this nice semantic code navigation. I want to shout out specifically a lot of people, but I know uh, Damien Gard put a ton of work on this. Um, this goes back to this issue was opened June 2019. And it's taken a lot of work updating these um, um, tree sitters and everything. So they were called out in the um, announcement post here on GitHub. But I just a big thank you to the the folks that set that up. That's going to make .NET coding easier. That's definitely been a godsend in terms of yeah. productivity. <laughs> yep, exactly. Being able directly in the in the GitHub interface to be able to search through. So yeah. Uh, cool. This is a cool one from Shahed. So he's writing about debugging multiple .NET Core projects and VS Code. Um, so he answered this question um, from an individual and so might as well just write it up as a blog post. And so he shows how to set up a launch configuration, his launch JSON. Um, this is, again, like, you know, regularly you'll have like a front end app and a back end API or maybe a few different APIs. And so running and debugging those all it uh, can be a pain, and um, so this is nice to just set up a launch configuration. And then also, this is nice with the launch panel um, and being able to have with the um, terminal, you can have multiple terminals as well. So that, that's nice to be able to do that. So that's that. All right, Christos. Uh, so this is something that they've been coding up on their 425 show. They were on our show, um, gosh, about a month ago now. Um, and talking about integration, integrating with, uh, in that case, they were doing Microsoft.identity.web. Uh, so here, th here they're showing accessing Microsoft Graph from gRPC using Azure AD. So uh, there's a lot here. He's, he's he, you know, he talks about benefits of gRPC. Um, talks about all the integration. A lot of screenshots here, of course, because we've got to go through and set up the Azure AD. Uh, integration, um, so he does all the app registration stuff um, and updating a gRPC service, et cetera. Um, but then once you're done and you're running it, it's wonderful. You do the uh, Azure AD authentication. It works. Everyone's happy. Um, so he shares out the code. And then if you want to see more about it, you can interact directly with them uh, on Tuesday mornings. They have this 425 show. All right, uh, Yarp. So this is cool. Yarp uh, just released 100 Preview 6 and some neat things here. There's support for uh, HTTP helper for query transforms, header-based routing, which, which um, I understand was an important um, uh, user request. And so cool to see as they continue rolling this out. And they have uh, support for 500 RC2, so that's good stuff. Okay, here's another Blazor one. Uh, this is N Neil Swimberger, and he's talking about a real-time application with Blazor Server and Firestore. So I actually have two clustered together here. Firestore is a, a Google technology um, on Google Cloud Platform, and he's showing integrating that. Uh, so there's Firebase and Firestore, and he does the walkthrough creating the application, uh, creating the Firestore backend. Um, integrating that in with a .NET console application. And then we also see uh, later integrating with the real-time real -time UI with Blazor Server and Firestore. So this is cool. So it's neat uh, because Blazor is, you know, it's web technologies. It's all, it's all uh, you know, open standards and all that can integrate with whatever backend. So cool to see that. And then so there's Google, and here's a cool one from AWS. And so AWS has this open source porting assistant for .NET. So this is .NET in general, any up, you know, updating any 
.NET Framework to .NET Core. Um, what's they'd previously announced this in July, and what they are announcing here is that it's open source. They're open sourcing it. So this is cool. This is something that'll analyze .NET Framework .NET Framework applications and help you understand. Um, what you'll need to do in order to move to .NET Core, as well as give some recommendations. So for instance, he gives an example here of configuring a recommendation for like system data SQL client. Um, and talking about, you know, here's, here's what your recommended update will be, you know, add a reference to this. So these are all these rules. They have pre-configured ones and you can extend them as well. So you can extend using these JSON things. You can also, they have support for um, Roslyn analyzers. And so he talks about there, there's this, uh, here he's talking about in the Codelizer repository and using Roslyn based code analyzer for that. So this looks like a really um, you know help, helpful utility as you're analyzing your applications. There's of course other things, there's the um, porting assistant and there's things in the docs where we make recommendations. Um, but this this is a really nice kind of uh, automated thing that you can point at your source code. So. All right, uh, just a couple more. Um, so this is, um, actually this is the last one because this one here is a dupe. So uh, this is a, a neat one. This is a community roadmap. Um, there's been a lot of, this has been you know built up over, um, there's been years of contributions on this. And this is neat. This is a ASP.NET Core developer in 2021. So looking ahead, here's kind of a map of things to learn. So, you know, talking about the general development skills, C Sharp, Solid, ASP.NET Basics, and then getting into more advanced things. So like task scheduling or microservices. And this is up to date, including things like Dapper and Tie. So that's kind of the map up at the top and then links to all these different places where you can learn about it. So this is, this is always cool to see the community building these sorts of things out. So, wow, a lot of good stuff. As always, I'm always thinking like, oh, do we have any links today? And then I'm frantically cutting them out because there's just too much goodness. So that is all my links I've got today. <laughs> all right, so what do you got for us, Rob? So I wanted to talk about, you know, before I get into demos and show you what we have, sort of give some historical basis of how we landed up here, right? So we've mm -hmm. had this library uh, in .NET called System Diagnostics Diagnostic Source. Specifically, there was a like a type of interest called activity. And activity was basically the primitive used for, you know, tracking distributed tracing information. And I think back in, uh, was it 3.1? We did some work where, you know, if you, uh, in the context of an ASP.NET application, we created a new activity for every incoming request. And then on outbound requests, we sort of propagated this information and, you know, we used known HTTP headers. And so on the other side, if you had another ASP.NET application, it would understand the distributed tracing information we sent over the wire, it would interpret it and ergo you could, you know, uh, propagate this information from app to app. And what we had done is we invented this hierarchical format. And the way we did it was we looked internally, we saw what a couple of teams in Azure were doing and we thought, hey, this is a good way to represent it. At the same time in the community, there were a couple of projects There was uh, open tracing and open census. And they sort of merged together to form this new project called Open Telemetry. And Open Telemetry is now part of the CNCF. Uh, for folks who are not familiar, that's the you know Cloud Native Computing Foundation, which is part of the Linux Foundation. Right? And what they're trying to do is they are trying to now define a vendor neutral specification for publishing and capturing observability data. And when I say observability data, there's sort of this consensus in the industry that there are three pillars of observability. So we have tracing, which is distributed tracing, logging, and metrics. So open telemetry is trying to grow into the role to solve all those needs. But the focus of the project pr primarily, the, I mean, at least thus far, has been on distributed tracing. So while we're looking at investments, especially in the .NET 6 timeframe to align the metric story in .NET with uh, open telemetry, 
today let's focus on the distributed tracing aspect of it. Sounds so good. let me go ahead and pull up this link. I'm always worried when we're on this stream because one of the tabs is our stream yard. I'm scared know, of closing it. Yeah. <laughs> uh, can you see my screen, John? Uh, it's up there now. Okay, so this is first thing I want to point folks to. There's this, uh, like I mentioned, right? Open telemetry aims to define a vendor neutral specification. So this repository sort of has the specification. So this is a language agnostic specification. And then it's really up to the open telemetry implementations in each of the language stacks to implement the specification. What, so what we did in .NET is when we spoke to customers, the thing that we found out is uh, folks are wary of taking uh, external dependencies when they're building libraries like it's a little different if you're an end user right but as a library we've all you know we know the horrors of binding redirects of pass mm -hmm. and conflicting versions of transit dependencies so what we said is hey if this specification is stable let's make sure the primitives that exist in dotnet can capture the same fidelity of information or at least everything that we think makes sense so the open telemetry uh so there's a project called OpenTelemetry.net, which understandably you can guess from the name is the .NET implementation of the OpenTelemetry project, and this is supported on, um, you know, .NET four, five, and above, and uh, .NET Core, all the supported versions of .NET Core. So it's you know it's pretty widely applicable. And what we said, and I I won't read through the entire document, but the basic guidance is rather than directly relying on the Open Telemetry APIs, so you don't. In your, if you're a library author, you don't need to take a dependency on this. You can just use, uh, you know, like uh, types in system diagnostics diagnostic source, which is actually part of the BCL. It also ships as a new package for like you know framework, and you can create these types. And now, because we have the same projection of data that Open Telemetry spans do, when you integrate your project with open telemetry like if you add in their exporter apis for example you use open telemetry to export this data to zipkin and if that doesn't make any sense no worries i'll cover it in a demo very soon uh you get that information without having you know taken a dependency on open telemetry to synthesize the data so they're really you know the the biggest call to action i have today is if you're a library author now is a seriously good time to look at adding support for open telemetry, right? So let's do this. Let me hop over into Visual Studio and I'll show a couple, like I'll show a simple demo and then we'll go from there, right? So, okay. sorry, John, did you say something? No, just sounds okay. good. Okay, yep. <laughs> so we have this, you know, like I mentioned, we have this new uh, uh, activity API and what we've done is we sort of made it uh, as part of the work to you know, make it more compatible with Open Telemetry, we also made it a more ergonomic and easy to use API. So now, if you were a library author, this is sort of the pattern you'd be using to create an activity. So I have an activity source here; it's a named activity source. And whenever I have my operation of interest, I can use the uh, activity source to start a new activity. And you know, it in it handles certain things for me, like it makes sure like you know, you obviously don't want to allocate, create an activity if no one's listening, right? Or based on uh, the sampling policy, you might, this activity might not be observed. You might only observe 10% of all, all um, you know, traces going through the system. So it, it sort of is smart there and helps you save on things. But once you're, you know, in the context, in, in this context and you have an activity created, you can do stuff like annotate it with information. You obviously have, you know, Tags are a set of key value pairs. Events are certain, you know, operation with timestamps. And then there are certain, you know, um, other key value pairs you can add, like status is something that's defined as part of the open telemetry span specification. It's something we don't quite have in .NET yet, but you can use, um, you know, I think there's some, uh, what's the word I was looking for? Semantic guidance on use a well-known uh, tag I'm actually trying to look uh, at it here, yeah. but I would say, you know, this would be a good link for folks to check out. It's on the open telemetry side and this is the guidance. So yeah, for things that aren't necessarily supported, you can set, you know, well-known tags and things like that. So anyway, 
now that I've created the activity, uh, there are two ways to consume it, right? You could create an activity listener directly, and that's sort of the raw, you know, BCL type. Mm-hmm. Or what you could, what you would most likely be doing is you'd be using Open Telemetry, right? And what I've done here is, I have configured a tracer provider, and in this case, I've added a console exporter. So this is again, you know, this is a simple demo. But you know, in a more real-world application, you might add a Zipkin exporter, and you know, you'd probably add this Zipkin exporter to both your front end, back end, or you know, whatever all the tiers of your service, so it can stitch together the information. So okay. if I go ahead and run this, there shouldn't be anything interesting right now. But I just want to you know show this. So this is sort of information that we've annotated on the activity. There's a couple of other things like you know the start time and the duration that it creates for us. And remember, we're talking about events. Like I added a you know an event of my own, and it gave me like a, a timestamp. So uh, I happen to see there's like a couple of questions pouring in about the exporters in Zipkin, and prom- yeah. I promise you folks I will get to it. Uh, okay. So now that I've Suspense. done this. <laughs> Uh, yeah. So, so I was talking about what library authors have to do, right? They have to do something like this. Mm-hmm. Now, obviously, we would be amiss if we didn't do it in our own libraries. So what we've done is in ASP.NET Core uh, and in HTTP Client, we've already done this for you. Ah, right? okay. So now, if even if you're, say, if you're speaking from like a Python application to a .NET Core application, you know, if the Python application is instrumented with open telemetry, and then it uses the W3C trace context. So that's a recently ratified W3C standard that tells you how to propagate this information using HTTP headers, right? Which is really cool because then, like like you're saying, it's W3C standard, and it's this includes front end, back end, microservices, all that stuff. So instead of poking around and saying like, is the problem here? Is the problem here? You can get this kind of complete view yeah and so that's you know that's our goal we've been working very closely on this effort with the uh, the team that owns azure application insights hmm. and you know i think the 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 desire for a, a vendor neutral specification is great and especially one that works across all languages so it's something uh you know the thing that i'm showing you is something where application insights will get to it you know We'll, you know, we'll get to the point where it can be open telemetry based, but mm-hmm. it's not just for .NET. It's going to achieve that for all languages. Now, one place that I've seen Zipkin recently is when I've been going through the Project Tie things, and that, and that has integration with Zipkin as, w- or there's a um, an extension. I forget what it's called. Right. It's like a plugin or extension for that. So, so that's nice to see that kind of. Is there any kind of overlap between what they're doing with Project Ty and this work with Open Telemetry? Right. Uh, it's, it's funny you ask that question because I was doing something unrelated, but I happened to have this window open right here. Uh, so uh, I think in a earlier talk when I was here, I came and spoke about um, you know Event Pipe and the Diagnostic Server. Mm-hmm. So one yep. of the things is in addition to you know I was talking about the raw BCL API activity listener that you could use to get this information. We also have a way of egressing this information from out of the process. So you don't have to be present within the process to get to it. So I have this .NET trace, come on, uh, I can try and zoom in. And the provider of interest is the Microsoft Diagnostics Diagnostic Source. And you can say, hey, I want to listen to you know certain events. Uh, you know, I apologize because this is extremely confusing, but we had to define a DSL and, uh, you know, s- stick it into a string to s- turn on what provider. So in here, I've only enabled the uh, start of this, uh, the start provider and I get the span ID. So, you know, Ty, um, while Ty injects some stuff in your application, the way it actually gets distributed tracing information is effectively using this. They'll subscribe to a couple more events and a couple more providers but they are using the activity information and that's how, um, and then Ty populates it in its own process and then sends it to Zipkin, which you can use to visualize. Ah, uh, okay. Right. So what I'm gonna do is I'm actually gonna show you a demo. I'm, I'm running it with Ty, but that just happens to be incidental, but I'm gonna uh, be using uh, 
Zipkin directly from my application. So I'm not really relying on the, you know, the the tie. Uh, I'm not relying on tie per se. So, mm -hmm. um, oh, sorry. Just one thing before I jump over. I want to say, yes, while you can use Activity Listener to directly consume this information, you're more likely going to be using something like OpenTelemetry. And then OpenTelemetry has the notion of exporters. So it's sort of the same core library, uh, very similar to like our iLogger syncs, right? You can plug in different logger providers and mm -hmm. you get the same fidelity of information going out to different syncs. So I was showing you in this example, I had a console exporter that I just ran and I could have added Zipkin. Uh, but I'm going to hop over now to this ASP.NET uh, application I have. And what I've done here is I've set up distributed tracing. So I had to do a couple of things. I'm in my uh, startup.configure services. And I said, hey, let's add open telemetry. And I told you, right, uh, ASP.NET Core had already has already been instrumented with activity. And so has uh. HTTP client. But these sort of extension methods tell you, hey, let's start listening to the information created by this stuff. All right. So I don't know if now's a good time, but this is okay. an interesting question from Alfred. He's asking for the difference between tracing in this context uh, versus that that's in Microsoft extensions logging when using trace log level. Okay, so uh, so the trace log level just happens, to, you know, the word trace happens to be overloaded, and the trace log level when we're talking about logging is just one of the different levels of verbosity, mm -hmm. right? This isn't that. So when I'm talking about distributed tracing here, I'm really talking about how do I see the causal links between relationships? I, mm -hmm. I promise you it will make more sense if you bear with me <laughs> for just another minute or so. It's I mean, the whole thing comes down to it's distributed, right? So in a distributed yeah. application, you're trying to f understand, I've got a back end, I've got a data tier, I've got an API, I've got this, I've got the front end, right. you know, API, maybe multiple front ends, and how do I understand what failed? What? Why did this order come in and and not get trans? Or why is it slow right. or whatever? Right. But uh, there's there's also the 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 interesting bit, which is you might want to see like this Gantt chart or waterfall of these causally related operations. But most likely, mm -hmm. once you see that, you're gonna probably want to go back to your logs. And I'm I'm gonna get to that in a bit too. As part of the distributed tracing work, we also made it um, we made logging distributed tracing aware. Uh, so I'll, I'll get to that. So I have this, uh, you know, so uh, the application I was showing you is this trivia game that's been built. So there's a front end and a back end. It's a Blazor front end talking to gRPC back end. And sort of I had to do this in both my applications. I said, hey, let me add distributed tracing. And in this case, I say, uh, let me add, uh, you know, ASP.NET Core instrumentation, HTTP client. I have an always on sampler here, but there's sort of, you know, different sampling strategies, like I mentioned. You can only sample some of the stuff going in. And then mm -hmm. I sort of just got my connection string and I'm sending my data here. So now for the fun bit, which is, um, let me pull over a tab. Okay, so this is the application I've written. So let's go to this bit where I play trivia. Uh, you know, I'm gonna play as John. All right. Uh, no, my score doesn't count. <laughs> uh, no, what this did is actually it started a streaming uh, gRPC call. So the service actually streaming me questions. If I go ahead and like say answer this question, the server yeah. streams me another question right away. Nice. And let me go ahead and answer another question. It was a simple game, two questions. You did really well, John. You scored a hundred percent on the quiz, and you know I can go ahead and play again. But I'm gonna go ahead and close this for now. And so, you know, I, I told you all these things. There's a front end, back end, which if effectively there are a bunch of operations that are causally related, right? And I would mm -hmm. love to see that relationship. So how, like, how would I do that? So because I've been sending this information to Zipkin and now hopefully a lot of the folks I have frustrated by not getting to Zipkin up until now will be happy. I can go in here. So I had Zipkin running locally. And you see Zipkin's this thing? really cool. Like when I first, uh, that was my first um, look at it was going through the Blazor tutorial, or I mean, excuse me, the TIE tutorials tie and seeing this visualization is beautiful. Like it's, it's, I mean, it's useful yeah. too, but it looks cool. <laughs> no, absolutely. And so, you know, I was telling you all these things, like this was the beginning of the Blazor circuit. And, you know, I did this start trivia. It was a gRPC mm -hmm. call. You can see this, this information came from gRPC. Uh, I even have the open telemetry status code reported by GR the gRPC library because it's aware. 
And then mm-hmm. this is my, you know, I said there was a streaming call. So you can see there's this 17 second long call. Excuse me. And then you see uh, at the end, at the completion of that, I sent another call to hit, get my score. And you mm-hmm. can see, uh, you know, this is uh, it's sort of these were small. So you might have missed it at first. Mm-hmm. But this is like a time series view of this. Right. Okay. Uh, and this stuff is super cool. But I'm now going to jump back over to my code and show you something else. So now bear with me for a couple of seconds. I'm going to take a small detour and go back and talk about logging. Right. So okay. let's do this. Okay. So. Uh, so the tra- the tracing at that level wasn't showing specific log log stuff. It's mm-mm. showing the timing. It's it's a time. Right. So like, it has the yes. So there are like certain like you know properties associated with it one is like start stop you can add like tags to it which is basically like um, key value pairs of information you can also mm-hmm. have activity links like you know i showed you a simple thing where one thing called another which called another sometimes you can have like batched operations you can you know fire 10 off together so you can have uh, links that say, hey, this is my peer rather than this is my parent. So all of that could be, you know, visualized using that. Sort of think of, you know, the, um, you know, in Chrome, you have that thing where you see the order of HTTP operations. Mm-hmm. Uh, it was, where's that gone? Like the network activity? Yeah, exactly. Uh, this one, right? Okay. Mm-hmm. And you see this waterfall. It's something like, you know, that's a very similar visualization to Mm-hmm. But so I'm, I'm taking a small detour to talk about logging and it will make sense in a second. Right. Yeah. So I just want to remind folks. So this is simple. You know, I'm using logging in a console application and I've done this thing called, you know, uh, logger dot begin scope. And, you know, we've had uh, we use uh, um, an async local to uh, persist scope information. So even if, you know, you go async to perform other operation, this remains. And what this effectively does is says, hey, all these log messages that happen inside this logging scope, please annotate this information, right? Uh-huh. So if I go ahead and run this sample, you know, uh, oh, that took longer than I thought. Okay. So, you know, these are the logs that I expect, like, hey, log information. So you see info, you see the stuff, but then you see this information annotated for each of these logs because we're running inside the context of the logging scope right and so this because this mechanism exists in logging we said hey why don't we make the log smarter and we make it activity aware so i'm going to hop into this example now and you might have deduced what i'm getting at which is if we have this way to just you know stick arbitrary baggage on logs, why don't we stick what activity you're running under right now? So we added a couple of options on the logger. So you say now when I'm creating you know configuring logging, I say activity tracking options, and I said hey you know annotate each of my logs with the span ID, trace ID, and parent ID. Okay. Right? Uh, so trace ID is, you know, for the current operation, parent is who invoked me and span is that logical identifier that goes, you know, across the entire trace. Okay. Right. And once I did this, uh, uh, so the, the other thing I have to do is I have to actually be running in the context of an activity for this to, you know, yield anything useful. But in this case I am, so I created an activity. So now I'm running a sentence inside the context of an activity. So now if I go ahead and run this, uh, you can see, so I still have the same, you know, scope information from last time, right? This one, but mm-hmm. also you see this new stuff added. I have my span ID, trace ID, and parent ID. Now, you know, we would be amiss if we didn't put two and two together and realize we could offer you something that works right out of the box. Yeah. Yeah. So what I did, uh, so you don't have to do this, by the way, if you're running an ASP.NET core, this stuff happens for you directly. But if you're running in, uh, you know, in another context or newing up your logger and you want to be distributed tracing and where you might have to do this. So if I go back over to this uh, tab, right? So you see, we were looking at this, you know, operation. Mm -hmm. So you see, there's this trace ID associated with this operation. And I'm going to go ahead and copy this. And now I'm going to go to where my logs live right now. Uh, And so 
you know, I, I, I just happen to be using Diet to run it, but whatever your eventual log store is. And I'm just going to do a naive, you know, search and page and stick in that trace ID and boom. Ah. And this is sort of the workflow you would be using, right? You'd be like, yeah. hey, I go look at this, uh, you know, distributed trace and something seems amiss. Let me use this as the way to key into my logs and identify what went wrong. Mm -hmm. And all of this, you know, just works. You got it. You don't have to do like anything for the logs to be activity aware. Okay. Okay. Just by setting those things, then it's, it's, it's added into your logs as well. Right. So, Cool. So, yeah, just, uh, well, go ahead, John. Uh, so there's a question here, and I, I've seen Zipkin. I haven't seen Jagger. So there's a few people asking how this compares to Jagger. So I personally have not used Jaeger. Okay. Uh, I, I I mean, I, I wouldn't be the you know best person to comment. Okay. However, I do want to point out that uh, it's all you need is a different exporter for open telemetry. Like the code uh, right. you write should not change. And that's the goal of this project. So you just write to the standard, the open telemetry standard, and then any thing in that yeah, ecosystem so can go back yeah. in here, you know, so there, there are a couple of things. When you set up open telemetry, you say, what all instrumentation types do I want? Mm -hmm. Right. So in this case, I said, I want ASP.NET Core, I want HTTP client. Uh, there was the other one in which I think I said, Hey, I want gRPC as well. Right. Uh, then you say, what is, the sampling. So how many of these samples do you want to consume? And there are different philosophies you can have. And then the last bit is you add the exporters. You're like, where do you want to send this information? Okay. Right. And, you know, I added Zipkin. I believe there's a Jaeger exporter. And if there isn't, I trust, you know, there'll be one very, very soon. Uh, and, you know, we're working, we're looking at adding an application insights uh, exporter. I know a couple of the other APM vendors uh, have it. I think, you know, uh, I, I don't remember which ones. I think maybe was it Splunk and I want to say Datadog have exporters. And this is sort of, you know, the move across the industry. Everyone's moved into this. Okay. Here's a, a relatively big question here. I'm not sure. Okay. Uh, do you, do you see this on the screen here? Yeah. So they say teams historically have used the GUID. And that uh, the link that star 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 is ASP.net. That's it stars out links. Oh, I see. Got it. Yeah. So they want to map incoming GUID header as a parent trace ID. So I don't know that it. Uh, the ASP.NET layer is pluggable enough. However, you could sort of, I, I think, I, I don't think you can change the ASP.NET behavior. However, what you can do is you can create a new activity, like new up your own activity context, uh, and you can instantiate okay. that activity context uh, using that incoming header. Okay. So you'd be able to map it to right. that. Uh, the, the format though, like the GUID is not compatible with the open telemetry specification, mm -hmm. right? Like, uh, so, you know, there so might be what some would be better there. is to, yeah, what would be better is to instead, instead of doing your own custom GUID in a header to actually just use the W3C, like to use the standard stuff, right? All right. If, yeah. if uh, so I, I'm not sure how they're using the GUID. If the GUID is just like to correlate their logs, they could very much just add tags. Like, you know, in mm. my example, oh shoot, where'd this go? Give me one second, I'll hop back over here. You see, I added this tag with the server name. Oh, uh, right, so you can- You can you just can add a tag. So it's hard tags, to say so. based on how you're using it, but the expectation is the solution should be complete and you know it should be usable. Okay, so you, I could put multiple tags based on whatever I'm- Yep. Okay, cool. All right. And so so I can, you know, the, the one thing I want to talk to is about uh, the, the project and what the maturity level is. Mm -hmm. So right now the open telemetry.net implementation is in beta. The idea is as soon as .net 5 goes GA or soon after that, 
we want the the open telemetry project will go GA. Again, you know, that's a recommendation. I can't speak for it because it's a independent project with its own governance. Yeah. Uh, but I mean, and and G- pro- GA means general availability, yes. which is basically released. That's yes. Been, It'll be a yeah. stable version, which is released. The good thing is library authors can, you know, start working on um, instrumenting their applications because they don't need to rely on, wait for the open telemetry stuff. Oh my God. So <laughs> my fire alarm is being tested. Oh, good. <laughs> oh. Well, if it's a real fire, then uh, I'll just. Uh... Right. <laughs> Unfortunately, John, I think we have to end oh, now. No. Okay. Well, that was a great demo. <laughs> we'll share the links. Be safe. <laughs> All right. <laughs> okay, I guess we'll end there then. <laughs> well, thanks a bunch, Sarab. This was a this was a fun show. Yeah, that's, I told you suspense. I did promise suspense for the show. So um, the community links I shared them earlier. Um, I added in the link to the OpenTelemetry.net. Um, so as he said, it's in um, it's in GA uh, or it's in beta now. Will GA? at or shortly after um, .NET 5 releases, and that's expected for .NET Conf. So .NET Conf is coming up, and that's uh, .NET Conf is November 10th through 12th. And uh, so a lot of cool stuff happening then, and and uh, including .NET 5, so very much looking forward to that. And uh, I guess we'll wrap up there. For those that are watching on Twitch, we'll go raid somebody. and. Uh, all right. The, the, I think that that breaks some records for suspense in a show. So um, we'll, we'll let you know when uh, when we hear from Sarab that he's okay. All right. Thanks, everybody. Do, 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 do.